19th century style military display, a reminder of a country's fight for independence. This is Argentina. Here, military power is more than symbolic. 165 years after independence, the men in uniform control the nation's politics. Five years ago, the armed forces intervened and overthrew civilian government. They've ruled Argentina ever since, with an iron grip on both their opponents and on the economy. A three-man military junta runs the country and elects the president. In September last year, they decided that General Roberto Viola will become the new president on March 30th this year. General Viola was the personal choice of the man standing down, General Jorge Videla. He is seen as a reluctant army officer thrown into power. But Viola is viewed as a competent politician, and there are hopes in Argentinian political circles that his presidency will pave the way for a return to civilian government. A dialogue with social and political organizations has begun, but it's being conducted in slow motion. Many military men are wary of a return to democracy. Even if constitutional rule is restored, the military want to maintain supreme reserve power. It would be democracy under the army's guidance. The military intervened in 1976 to put an end to what they saw as civilian anarchy and economic chaos. They overthrew and arrested President Isabelita Perón, widow and successor to Juan Perón. For many Argentinians, the Perón name had a kind of magic. In the years after World War II, Juan Perón had been a populist dictator who appealed to Argentinians through their pockets, while his first wife, the legendary Eva, appealed to their hearts. Ousted in 1955, he returned on a wave of popular fervor in 1973. He died the next year, leaving his second wife, Isabelita, as heiress to Peronism. Isabelita's government was a disaster. Inflation rose to 500% a year, and Argentina's financial reserves were exhausted. Her cabinet changed 10 times in two years. The army hoped to harness the Peronist movement as a bulwark against the left. But as political infighting grew, many military men decided that only their direct control could restore order. As the officers received honors from President Isabelita, they planned her overthrow. The mastermind was the new president-elect, General Roberto Viola. It was a bloodless clockwork coup. The military promised to revive the economy and impose order. Yet the new government had powerful opponents. Peronism was still a potent political force. The leftist Montoneros guerrillas had Peronist sympathies. And there was another major terrorist group, the People's Revolutionary Army. When the military took over, it saw Argentina's choice as rule by the junta or rule by the gun. The army's guns brought peace, but the price was high. In their undercover action against the terrorists, the military's methods were brutal. The war was brief and bloody. As the army clamped down, the guerrillas became more desperate, resorting openly to shootings and bombings. This bomb in the capital was meant to kill a prominent Argentine admiral. He escaped, but three people, including his 15-year-old daughter, were killed. It was guerrilla warfare, but in the cities, not the countryside. This guerrilla hideout, about 20 kilometers from Buenos Aires, fell to the security forces after a three-hour battle in which the army used mortars and rockets in addition to machine guns. The house was reduced to a virtual shell with gaping holes in the walls and roof. Unconfirmed reports said seven guerrillas died in the house. The picture of Isabelita Perón indicated that they were members of the Montenero group. 
In a poor area of La Plata, north of the capital, a captured hideout belonging to the second organization, the People's Revolutionary Army. The firepower the military used in these actions demonstrated their determination to destroy all anti-government groups. These wrecked remains after shootouts were the visible face of the anti-terrorist campaign. After a year, the junta was claiming to have virtually destroyed the People's Revolutionary Army and its arsenals. Yet there was another side to the campaign. Many suspects, it's alleged, were rounded up at dawn by security forces in plain clothes. Most of these people simply disappeared. Amnesty International, the London-based human rights group, compiled a file of the missing. They listed 2,665 people who disappeared between March 1976 and September 1979. Estimates of the total number of missing range from between 5 and 20,000. Most are now believed to have been the victims of arbitrary detention and summary execution. At a London press conference last year, two men who escaped from secret detention described their experiences and provided details on hundreds of prisoners. They claimed that most of them were not members of any terrorist organization. Horacio Cid de la Plaz was 20 when he was arrested in November 1977. In, on the 15th of November 1977, uh, when I was in the western zone of Buenos Aires, I was kidnapped. El secuestro realizado por aproximadamente entre 15 y 20 miembros de las fuerzas de seguridad que lo hacen con ropa civil. A group of plainclothes men who belong to the security forces, a group of about 15 to 20 men, uh, carried out my kidnapping. Para eh, muchos miles de familiares eh, que aún siguen sufriendo por la desaparición de, de sus seres queridos. En nuestro report, hemos intentado ser lo más objetivo posible y solo hablar de lo que tenemos personal experiencia de, porque hemos realizado que para miles de familiares de personas perdidas es esencial para ellos tener solo la verdad y solo lo que es exacto y conocido. Both men claimed that all the prisoners were subjected to systematic interrogation and torture. Finally, for most prisoners, transfer, the euphemism for death. How exactly were people tortured? What methods were used? Well, the first thing that they do when one person arrives to the concentration camp is uh, the torture of him. And they put uh, the prisoner in one big table of metal and they... Um, they began to, to give to him electric, electric shots. Also another kind of torture. They used to put a, a sack, a plastic sack in the head to make it asphyxia. Over the head. Over the head, or to put the head into the water and for one minute or near one minute. So the person began to to feel the asphyxia. And what kind of people did they do this to? Were they people who had been engaging in some kind of uh, subversive activity against the state? Yes. Well, uh, um, the argument of the government is that the people who were disappeared, uh, who were dead in Argentina, um, were subversives. But the reality is another. We saw in the concentration camp uh, more or less uh, 800 people. And only the 20 or the 25 uh, of that uh, of that percent uh, was member of an army organization. In Argentina itself, protests came from the so-called Mothers of the Plaza de Mayo, these were relatives, seeking news of kin they had little hope of seeing alive. Every Thursday afternoon until 1978, they marched slowly around the main square of Buenos Aires to draw attention to their cause. In January 1978, the women were ordered not to gather in the square again. Now they meet in churches and community centers. But their movement is still a reminder of the legacy of bitterness which remains from the junta's suppression of terrorism.
nuestros hijos que nos digan, pero que no nos dejen en esta incertidumbre. Yo tengo dos hijas desaparecidas. The mother's protests helped to draw world attention to the question of the missing detainees. The Organization of American States sent an investigating committee to question President Videla's government. After some hard lobbying, it's believed Argentina's military rulers restrained the commission from publishing the names of the officers involved. In return, the junta has begun to purge itself of its guilty soldiers. The suppression of terrorism and the creation of a stable economy were the two justifications for the army's intervention in politics. Like terrorism, the regime claims to have brought the Argentine economy under control. One of its early acts was to send soldiers into the markets to curb the speculators, who were blamed for the rampant inflation in consumer prices. Troops supervised transactions in the marketplace and made several arrests for economic crimes. As part of the economic strategy, imported produce has been allowed in to force down the prices of local goods. Argentina has long been regarded as one of the world's breadbaskets. The richness of the pampas grassland, with its topsoil 12 feet deep, made the country a leading grain exporter. But the wealth wasn't infinite, and Argentina's exports dropped. Under the junta, a series of mini devaluations has made Argentina's exports more competitive. The Soviet Union is a leading buyer of grain. Despite the battle against the left wing inside Argentina, the junta refused to join trade sanctions against Russia after the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. The government argues that the Argentinian people would not have gone along with harsh economic measures imposed by a democratic government. Only a military regime, they say, can see the economic plan through. It has been extremely hard in certain sections of the economy. The protective wall of tariffs surrounding Argentine industry has been dismantled. Foreign competition has put many local industries out of business. Five-figure bills for a tin of coffee. But the government claims that its anti-inflation policies are beginning to work. It's no longer possible to buy a car and then sell it a few months later for twice what you paid for it. Despite several mini devaluations of the peso, the currency was still considered to be overvalued. So before the presidential changeover, the government announced in February a 10% devaluation. The high-priced peso had sent Argentinians flocking abroad on shopping sprees. They were buying real estate in Uruguay, Brazil, South Africa, and even Miami. On the other hand, farmers on the Pampas were complaining that their produce couldn't compete with imports like canned tomatoes from Spain. The armed forces claim that over the past 30 years, no economic program until now had been applied for more than two years without a change of approach. But despite its economic achievements, the government has many critics. James Nielsen is the acting editor of the Buenos Aires Herald, an English language paper that has consistently reported human rights violations and been critical of government economic policies. Nielsen doesn't feel that the presidential changeover marks a new era in Argentinian politics. One could look back upon it in the future and say this is the start of a new era, but uh, simply because Viola is inheriting a government which is already dying. Perhaps the changeover will give the government a new lease of life in the sense that the public will concentrate on getting to know it for two or three months before moving into opposition. It may enjoy a kind of honeymoon, although I suspect that its honeymoon is already over even before it's taken power. It has been suggested that one of the main obstacles to a return to civilian rule is the possibility of legal action against officers responsible for human rights violations. Did he agree with that analysis? Uh, I think that that is quite an important factor, yes. Uh, but unfortunately, there are not really very many Argentines concerned with human rights. Uh, in the sense, they are 
are concerned about the human rights of their enemies or their political enemies, not just of their friends. So I, I think the government could reach a kind of deal with the political parties to head off any really determined attempt to look into what happened in between 1976 and, say, September 1979. Today, the armed forces are claiming success in defeating terrorism and restoring the Argentine economy. They have begun a dialogue with the old political parties. Yet there are limits to the degree they are prepared to withdraw from the country's political life. The officer's main fear is recrimination and retaliation. The legacy of the campaign against terrorism is one of lingering bitterness. Will Argentinians be prepared to forget the bloody past? For the present, at least, the military isn't taking any risks. Moves toward a civilian government may come, but it's the army that will make the rules and set the pace.